Good morning. Uh, so thankful that you are joining us in our traditional worship service this morning. My name is Nicholas Gonzalez and I'm the associate pastor here. And I pray a blessing on your worship this morning. We begin this morning in the name of our triune God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together, we confess our sins before God as we seek His mercy and His forgiveness. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. I therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, declare the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Let us pray. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your spirit to know those things that are right and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them always. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Hear the reading of the word, which comes from Philippians chapter 3 and is also the basis for our sermon this morning. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as a loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharings of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ, Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God 
in Christ Jesus. Together, we join as we sing and honor the Lord with the Alleluia verse. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it, dug a wine press in, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to the other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. His was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush on anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard the parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the Gospel of the Lord. To you, Hi everyone. Have you ever played a sport? Even if you weren't on the winning team, you may have been given a trophy. Trophies can be exciting because it means you had a goal and you stuck with it to the end. In today's Bible story, Paul talks about a different kind of prize. He teaches us that our goal is not to win trophies, but to win the prize that is Jesus. Because of God's love for us, we get to be with Jesus in heaven forever. This is the best prize and the greatest gift we will ever receive. Sometimes it's easy to focus on the awesome things we do, like winning a trophy. But when we put too much confidence in ourselves, we are called to focus on Jesus instead. When we do, we are reminded to keep our eyes on the true prize, which is everlasting life with Him. Let's fold our hands, bow our heads, and say a prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for being the best prize and our greatest reward. When we focus too much on our achievements or the things of this world, help us to focus on you instead. We love you so much. In your name we pray, amen. If you worshiped with us last week in person or online, you may have remembered that I talked about a passage from uh, the mid-first century letter of St. Paul to the church that he founded in the Roman provincial city of Philippi, located in northeastern Greece, about 400 miles north of Athens, and in which he talked about following the example of Jesus and living a life of humility for the glory of God and for our service to this world. In today's passage, which comes from just a little bit later on in that very same letter. Some of the same themes are captured, but what we have this time is much more of a personal story, a heartfelt testimony that Paul gives of his own journey from a past uh, of which he was very proud initially and then very ashamed later on and onto the only kind of future that ever matters at the end of the day and then what that could mean for the believers 
in the church at Philippi and what it can mean for followers of Jesus like you and me today as we journey from our own past into the present and on to the future. In Paul's case, as you heard, his past includes a, a very flattering spiritual pedigree on one hand and a very stunning confession about his life on the other hand. He starts out by saying uh, that he was circumcised on the eighth day, which is to say that he wasn't a convert to Judaism. He was actually born into the house of Israel. I was of the tribe of Benjamin, which would have been impressive, not only to Jewish Christians, but even to the Gentile Christians who were part of the Philippian church because uh, Benjamin was the only child of Jacob to actually be born in the promised land. The tribe of Benjamin and its territory was the only one to include the holy city of Jerusalem. And it was the only one to produce Israel's first king, whose name was Saul, which coincidentally was Paul's name before his conversion. And so Paul was saying, you know, I was a pretty special guy, big man on campus. I was a Hebrew, born of Hebrews, the real deal, pure bread, a man's man. I was even a Pharisee, making me a part of the religious elite, a person to be admired, respected, and even feared. And then all of a sudden, Paul radically changes his tune, and he tells another part of his story. And it's a very unpleasant, painful, ugly part of the story where he confesses even to the Philippians that he was a one-time persecutor of Christians, which is to say that Paul went out rounding up Christians in places like Damascus and bringing them back to Jerusalem for arrest and trial and even execution. In fact, Paul was there for the execution of the first martyr that we read about in the book of Acts. And maybe that's why in his letter to the Philippians, in other parts of it that is, he warns them and encourages them to persevere even in the face of persecution that would surely come their way. And I think he probably knew what he was talking about given the fact that his letter to the Philippians was written while Paul was under house arrest in Rome for his own faith. And yet that was a very important thing to do. And it really matters because it's not a part of the story that Paul minimizes. He doesn't sweep it under the rug. He comes to terms with it, which is the spiritually healthy thing to do. And you know, in our country right now, we're struggling with doing much the same thing, with coming to terms with our story. And it's a hard thing because we, we really don't like talking about the fact that 18 of our presidents, including eight while in office, were the owners of slaves, including people like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. We don't like telling that part of the story, but that's what the story is. And how are you ever gonna be healthy as a person, as a church, as a nation, if you don't come to terms with the past? which is exactly the first thing that St. Paul does and why this passage is still relevant and why it matters to you and me today. The second thing that he does is also hard for a lot of people to do. And that is he lets go of the past or in his own language, he throws it away and even looks at it as, as rubbish or a trash, in, a, in effect saying to the Philippians that, you know, all those credentials and all those laws and all that anger and all that hatred were just nothing but garbage compared to the surpassing value of knowing Jesus as my Lord, who makes it possible to leave the past behind and to throw it away and make it possible for Paul to do the third thing that he mentions, and that is move on, go forward, to live a new life as a child and a servant of God. In his words, Paul says, forgetting what lies behind 
and straining toward what lies ahead, I press on for the goal of the upward call of the prize in Jesus Christ. And once again, the guy knows who he's writing to because the image there is that of an ancient Greek race where the winner and the completer of that race would receive a wreath of leaves and a monetary award in the form of gold or some other precious metal. Except that in our case, our race is spiritual. And the prize is glory. And this one has been won for us by Christ at his cross, who gives us the crown of life. Friends, this passage is about what it means to get unstuck and to go on by the grace and power of Jesus. In the summer of 2004, there was a long-distance runner by the name of Vanderlei de Lima from Brazil who ran in the marathon, which was the final event of the Summer Olympics held in Athens, Greece, about 400 miles south of Philippi. And he was 30 seconds ahead of everyone else who was running in that marathon with only four miles left to go when all of a sudden, a man jumped out of the crowd and attacked him and pushed him into the crowd on the opposite side of the course, stopping his forward progress. Instead of giving up, when security guards and others in the crowd released him from his attacker, Vanderlei de Lima got back on the course. And he started running again, even though he was already overtaken by two other runners who came in first and second to win the gold and the silver. Nevertheless, he finished the race and he got the bronze. Nevertheless, amazingly, Vanderlei de Lima describes that moment of entering the stadium and crossing the finish line. And he said incredibly, I was so filled with joy that I forgot what happened back on the road. As a result, Vendor de Le de Lima received from the International Olympic Committee their highest honor for sportsmanship at the closing ceremonies that year. And he was the one to light the Olympic cauldron when his own country hosted the Summer Olympics in 2016. Or consider the story of Tom Terrence, who was born and raised in Mobile, Alabama, and by his own confession, grew up to be a white supremacist, an anti-Semite, and a terrorist member of the Ku Klux Klan until finally he was wounded in an FBI shootout, put in prison, escaped from prison, recaptured, and spent eight years in the Mississippi State Penitentiary. While Tom Terrence was in solitary confinement, he was transformed by the gospel as he read the New Testament on his own and by himself. Jesus changed his life so that when he finally got out of prison, Tom Terrence went to college. Then he went to seminary. And then he became the campus pastor of George Mason University. And then he became a director of urban missions and a pastor at a church called Christ Our Shepherd, which is an interracial, inter-ethnic ministry located, guess where? Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill, seven blocks behind the Capitol on North Carolina Avenue, until finally he retired not long ago as the president of the C.S. Lewis Institute. Tom Terrence published a book just last year called Consumed by Hate, Redeemed by Love, the story of how a violent Klansman became a champion for racial reconciliation. Friends, maybe there's a part of your past that has come to a close. Maybe there's a chapter in your past that needs to come to a close. How did that happen for Tom Terrence? Well, it happened because by the grace of God and in the tradition of St. Paul, the champion of the gospel, a rock star for the mission and the ministry of the early church. He didn't sweep his past under the rug. He didn't minimize his story. He came to terms with it. He didn't dwell on it or carry it around like a heavy load that stopped him in his tracks. He let it go and he threw it away. 
because Jesus makes that possible. And like a runner who gets back on course after being attacked by the one who is out to stop all of us in our spiritual forward progress, he goes on to live a new life and fulfill a new purpose, which is to love the one who first loved us by loving our neighbors, no matter who they are. If there's a chapter in your past that needs to come to a close, you have an example to follow today. In the church's greatest and first missionary, a rock star for the gospel, and a couple of examples of others who are a little more recent in our history. And it may include taking a look at all of the things that have been slowing you down. It may include coming to terms with the fact that your identity, your value has been based on your credentials or your pedigree or your background or your accomplishments. Or maybe it was something that you did. Maybe you mistreated somebody. Maybe you lied. Maybe you cheated, maybe you betrayed somebody, or maybe there's just a lot of trash, you know, that's occupying way too much real estate in your head and your heart, and it just needs to be thrown away. And it includes letting all of that go, because Jesus makes that possible. Or in the words of St. Paul, forgetting what lies behind. Not that you can really put it out of your literal physical memory, but because it's done with. And it's been settled at the cross. And then it culminates in going forward and moving ahead joyfully as a person who's been forgiven, who's been redeemed, and who is eternally loved by the God of this universe. And what St. Paul is trying to say to the Philippians, and what I want you to hear today, is that that's also possible for you and me when, like him, we experience the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as our Lord. Because if that kind of grace can transform a person who was a one-time terrorist and an enemy of the church, then I have absolutely no doubt that it can help you and me and the people of this world to let go and to go on and press forward day by day, one step at a time, out of the past and into the future until we cross the finish line in the glory of God and we receive that crown of eternal life by the one who makes it possible and won it for you and me, because in him, the best is yet to come. Because in the words of St. Paul to the church in the great city of Philippi, Jesus Christ has made us his own. And he is ready to write the next chapter in your life. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Together, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we confess our common Christian faith found in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Together, church, we join our hearts and minds in prayer. As we pray for the church, the world, and for all of creation, trusting in God to hear us as we call. We pray. Holy God, give us a willing spirit that we may serve you with all that we have and all that we are. Help us to be faithful and fruitful in the godly use of your resources and gifts, that we may use them in accord with your will and for your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Everlasting Father, we lift up to you all those who fulfill the vocations of teacher and student. We ask that you would continue to give teachers wisdom and strength during this unique season of education. Help students to stay focused and give them a desire to learn. And bless parents who are the first teachers of their children. Watch over them, keep them safe, and continue to shine your light upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, Though we walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve us, deliver us, and fulfill your purpose for us. According to your steadfast love, grant healing and wholeness to all those who are bereaved, in trouble or adversity, or sick and in need of care. We ask that you would hold them in the palm of your hand as you continue to bestow your grace upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we ask for your guidance in the handling of the coronavirus pandemic. We pray that you would heal those infected, especially our president and his wife. And we ask for your protection for all those who are involved in healing those who are afflicted. We humbly implore you to impart your knowledge, wisdom, and discernment to those seeking a cure. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, keep this nation under your care. Bless the leaders of our land that we may be a people at peace among ourselves and a blessing to other nations of the earth. Help us elect trustworthy leaders, contribute to wise decisions for the general welfare, and thus serve you faithfully in our generation to the honor of your holy name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God Almighty, you sent your Son into the world so that all who believe in him would have eternal life. Help us to grow in our knowledge of you as we study your word and desire to do your will. Give us peace knowing that no matter our suffering in the world, in Christ, We have gained the assurance of your mercy and grace, and nothing can separate us from your great love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, into your hands we commit all for who and for what we pray, trusting in you as together we pray the family prayer of the church. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive this blessing as you depart this morning. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.